we have a very uh, interesting uh, session in front of us. Uh, at least uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Sergey Palsov from MIT, and uh, I'm going to be uh, chairing this session. Uh, we have six presentations and uh, all six presenters are here, which is great. <laughs> so we are off to a good start. <laughs> I'll start with the first presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Ji Hoon Min uh, from Yasa, and he is going to take a look at the material. So 15 minutes uh, in front of you. Uh, well, you can time uh, kind of a little bit uh, less than 15 minutes to get uh, uh, some time for questions. Uh, so uh, Ji Hoon, please share your screen and uh, let's hear from you. Okay, um, I'm Ji Hoon Min and I will talk about this upstream sector implementing the implications of demand side transformations, especially for materials. Um, yeah, directly going to the next slide. So, so we are seeing a growing emphasis on the demand side transformations as an important mitigation options, more recently, more so. And, and started by um, Gurbler et al.'s LED low energy demand scenario. And we are seeing more discussions from Mundaka et al. and also Felix Kreuzig's recent publications. But so far, the material demands from this demand side transformation were not explicitly connected to the IAMs or the industry supply chains in an endogenous manner. So we haven't been able to see the system-wide impacts of this transformation. So we see it's very important to actually model these impacts of demand side transformations in IAMs. And that's what we've been doing. And we named it, we've been doing for our IAM message IX. And we named it as message IX materials for the supply side. And, and we also have separate developments going on for demand side modules, mainly for the key sectors like buildings and transport. And on top of this uh, combination of demand and supply side model implementations, we can develop then important demand side, demand side transformation scenarios like LED 2.0 or any other demand-driven scenarios. Our focus has been on, in terms of supply side, it has been on steel, aluminum, cement, and petrochemical sectors. And on the demand side, we um, model separate demand streams coming from buildings, transport, and power sector. We have it as a separate category and, and also consumer goods. And there is others all combined, not categorized. A high level model structure can be shown like this. So on in blue boxes, I'm showing the more conventional, the traditional message IX core as an energy systems model. And then we are adding this gray message IX materials box there as an implementation of industry side, material supply side. And we also have this separate demand modules for transport and buildings more internally. And then this red arrows are showing different streams of material demands coming from yeah, power sector, transport buildings and other exogenous demands. And on the supply side, this is showing just the trend of industry emissions, CO2 emissions by sector. And so far we are covering the steel, cement and aluminum and petrochemicals. So we are tackling you know, the biggest one first. In terms of sectoral coverage, we are doing okay. And this is showing the generic representation of industry sectors in our model. So at the top, 
we start from the primary material production. So we, we produce uh, finished material at this stage, and then we go on to product, product manufacturing. And at the end of the lifetime of those products, we collect the scrap material. And then a certain part of the scrap material is picked up through this recovery procedure and then fed back into the secondary material production. And of course, this scrap process is uh, available for metallic materials, not for, not for cement. And the scrap recovery decision is based on the processing cost and energy requirements of different scrap quality levels. On the demand side, um, the first important demand flow is coming from residential buildings. And this is modeled through this message X buildings framework, which is a bottom up model modeling the construction demolition dynamics of the building floor spaces. And it combines the material intensities and bringing back the activity, the floor space and energy material demands back to message side. And this is now parametrized based on the LED type scenario assumptions. The detail is given here in the bullets. And this is not just one directional estimation. It's actually getting back the energy price feedback from the message side. So it goes through the iterations. And we have a material demand from the transport side. And for this exercise, we, we have done this uh, through exogenous estimation based on elite assumptions. And that's for passenger vehicles for now. And for the power sector, this is linked more endogenous manner. So the power sector dynamics of um, construction and retirement of power plants are linked with material intensities and scrap release per unit of installed capacity. And as of now, we find that the share of this demand, the material demand from power sector is pretty low, but we can see from the plot here that the relative size of the material intensity is higher for lower carbon options. Wind and CSP and CCS, they have higher intensities. So we, we expect that it can be having higher implication, material implication as we move more towards low carbon economy. And we have a quantification for consumer goods material demand as well. I can be quick here. And in terms of total material demand, in the diagram here, it's showing the total demand feeding back into the, uh, the message side. The colored parts are showing the separate estimations I have described earlier, the buildings, transport, consumer goods, and power sector. And the gray parts are things that are not covered yet. So they are for now including the infrastructure, the industry demands, the freight transport, and commercial buildings. And we can see aluminum and steel demands are falling pretty significantly driven by the demand transformation, but the cement demand is pretty stable because we are not explicitly modeling the infrastructure demands. It's you know, staying there. And this is the initial result from the, the LED 2.0 scenario run. And I can guide you through some important stories. So <clears throat> you can see the on the right side, the final energy demand from the industry sectors, the total is falling 
quite significantly driven by the demand transformation. And then on the left side, on the material side, for example, for steel, we can see the growing share of secondary steel production, which is mainly manufactured and produced by um, electric arc furnace technology, which is electricity intensive. So we can see growing share of electricity among the total final energy. So that can imply very high decarbonization potential down the road dri driven by the demand side transformation. But without, without this model integration, we will not be able to see this quantification directly. It's the importance of this work. The last slide, as a conclusion, I, so we have suggested this framework for integrating the material energy and greenhouse gas in the end in a somewhat endogenous manner, not entirely, but partially. And I would say it has been a successful proof of concept, but we need to improve the coverage for the material demand. And for this purpose, we are developing and further linkages. On the demand side, we are including commercial buildings and passenger vehicles. On the supply side, we are adding plastics and ammonia sectors as well pretty soon. And as a caveat, um, we haven't considered the material substitution options yet. So for example, for vehicles, for the purpose of light weighting, we can switch steels with aluminum or a carbon fiber or whatever, but that, that measure is not included or considered yet. And the last emphasis will be on the importance of this issue, especially when we are um, discussing the concepts like sharing or circular economy, which will be having very high implications both on supply and demand, uh, both on energy and material supply and demand. And that the sharing circular economy is also centered around the very big transformation in the demand side. So if we want to consider these different components all together, then we will be in need of this uh, kind of model integration. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for staying in time. Uh, so uh, just a reminder uh, uh, from uh, our yesterday's uh, day, uh, uh, just uh, make sure that if you have questions, use the chat. And I see that uh, uh, we already have one question uh, in the chat. Or simply raise your hat, and uh, I'll try uh, uh, kind of uh, monitor that. But uh, probably chat will be easier to make sure that I haven't missed your question. Uh, so Jihun, we have uh, uh, yeah. one question uh, uh, about uh, how sure, sure. Uh, you are differentiate between OECD and developing countries. Can you expand on that? Um, yeah, in, in the SIS model, we have 11 regions and that's not separated by OECD and others, but it's more like you know, Europe, Africa, so that's, for those regions, we have separate demand projections as well. So, yeah. Well, I have my, uh, my own question. So can you elaborate a little bit on uh, kind of what is driving, well, let's say reduction in demand for steel, right? So you're showing that, well, over time, it's going to go down quite dramatically. So uh, kind of in, 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 in 30 seconds, can you just give your, give a, uh, uh, your explanation? So are we using kind of less heavy machinery, less steel, or we are using that more efficiently? What, what, is, what is the main driver for that reduction? It will be combination of all. And, and so we are adopting this LED narratives. So for example, the LED narrative is centered around this avoid shift or oh, uh, this, this framework. So it's also um, reducing a lot of activity 
So for example, the floor space of construction will be reduced pretty a lot. And the, the building of vehicles will be reduced. So those things will drive all the material demands pretty significantly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. So uh, we have more questions. So maybe uh, if kind of uh, for the sake of time, uh, you can try and type answers uh, uh, very briefly uh, to the questions in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, uh, well, thank you for your presentation. I think it's extremely important to uh, have these material flows represented uh, in our modeling. So great, great work. Uh, now uh, we are going to switch to our second presenter. So second presenter is Lydia Stermeri uh, from Paul Shearer Institute. And my understanding that now we are going to learn a little bit more about digitalization. Perfect, thank you so much. So good afternoon, everyone. And um, I will uh, discuss today uh, my research and I will talk about a new framework to include the societal changes influenced by digitalization in the net zero energy scenario. So where we start? Uh, we start with the, with the question, will digitalization benefit the energy transition? So what we know is that digital transformation will impact society and economy by introducing new business models for firms or company and introducing new lifestyles for uh, uh, individuals. Lifestyles that uh, can also be called uh, social practices. So what we want to know um, or to investigate is the impact that these changes will have on the energy system and consumption. So why we discuss about social practice, as you can see on the right graph, uh, social practice allows us to analyze uh, um, the cross-sectoral implication between uh, different lifestyles activities. So for example, we can uh, analyze the implication for the residential sector and the transport sector and the services sector, analyzing uh, social practices like commuting to work, eating houses, uh, learning or shopping. So in order to analyze this digital transformation, we have to model decision processes of households and company, uh, several energy sectors and technologies. And also um, we want to be sure that we have dynamic interaction over a long time horizon. Doing, to do that, uh, we create uh, our, this framework uh, where we uh, couple together an uh, energy system model that's based on the TIMES framework and a socioeconomic model that is an agent-based uh, model. Uh, you will see here that for the, the proof of concept, we apply this to a case study. So we use uh, uh, the Swiss Times Energy System Model SAM and uh, the SAMD we coupled together and to in our framework uh, we were able or we needed to integrate database from field studies and survey with the idea of uh, have a framework that can analyze uh, the technical and societally feasible energy transition in order to overcome the limitation of the social planner decision making that is common to the most energy system models so let's have a look on, the, on our socioeconomic model. It is called socio, uh, socioeconomic model for digital practices. Uh, in this uh, agent-based modeling approach, we have two different types of agents. One are the households and one are the companies. Both of these agents have different decision process. So the decision process for companies uh, is a cost-benefit analysis. While in the decision process of households, we have three different components. One is the, a behavioral component, one is an economic component, and one is a technologies availability component. As you can see um, in, the, in the graph, uh, the idea behind this model is that households use technology to perform different social practices, and then they ex exchange ideas and behaviors uh, among a social networks. So, the key feature, features of our model are that is a time horizon, is a long time horizon to 2050 on an annual base. Uh, is a, a performs a cross sectoral analysis because, as I said before, due to the analysis of social practices, we were able to, we need to model together um, several energy sectors, and the agents and the models evolve over the time, so is is dynamic over the time horizon. The output from our models are the energy services demand, uh, the technology diffusion, and also the digital level of the society. 
So thanks, we have a socioeconomic model that is able to uh, analyze different decision process. And we couple this with the, the times um, model that is an optimization model. Uh, we couple the two models with a soft link and in, in an iterative process. So uh, the output from the socioeconomic model that are the demand technology share and the energy services demand are the input for the times optimization models um, that analyze uh, the information that he has and as output provides uh, technologies costs, energy fuel costs, energy supply and infrastructure develop, deployment. deployment. And all these outputs are the input for the socioeconomic model. Uh, when uh, the uh, there is a convergence tolerance, when the tolerance is reached, then uh, um, the, the iteration stops and we have uh, the results from our uh, framework. So to see uh, if this, uh, to, uh, to have a proof of concept of our framework, we uh, apply this to a case studies for Switzerland. Uh, we want to analyze how the net zero climate uh, uh, scenarios change um, when connected with an increase in the digitalization. So we, uh, we combine the net zero climate target with one social practices, the teleworking one, that is strongly connected with digitalization. On the left, left side graph, you can see why also the teleworking practice was so useful for this proof of concept, because it allows us to analyze all the different sectors together and also all the different decision process together, because we have the eating house, the commuting to work that are related to the transport and residential sectors and are related to household practice and decision process. But at the same time, we have some uh, these, uh, business models for companies and also uh, some implication for government and society about the evolution of the network infrastructure. So we analyze two different scenarios. One is called a world uh, where the practice of teleworking is stable as in uh, 2020 uh, and um, e-world that is basically a digital world where uh, the um, agents selecting teleworking reduce their commuting to 100%. We combine this with uh, a climate target. So we want to reach the zero megaton of CO2 in 2015. And this has to be achieved by a CO2 tax that will increase uh, over the time horizon. So uh, let's move to some results. Of course, we, as I showed before, we have different output from both the models, but um, here I, I want to show that in the upper part, so the energy demands in 2050, we can see the difference in the energy demands for the two different scenarios. And we have that due to this teleworking practice, we have a reduction in the passenger transport demand due to less commuting. We increase uh, the residential energy demand because people will have to work from home. And at the same time, there is a reduction in the services sector energy demands due to the um, introduction of new business uh, uh, models connected to the teleworking practice. So we have an evolution of the demand. At the same time, we also have some technology share uh, adoption and diffusion from, the, from uh, individuals. And we can see how the combined frameworks uh, react. So what are the implications for the energy system? Um, we can see two main things from this graph, from the CO2 emission in 2050. First of all, we can see that the difference in the two scenarios for the transport and residential sector. And here we can see the impact of agent choice on technology adoption and diffusion. And the second thing that we can analyze is that we have a different energy system configuration. So our model is able to reach the zero target, suggesting a different energy system configuration, taking into consideration the technology adoption and diffusion uh, for, from individuals. If we want to analyze this uh, a little bit uh, in detail, uh, we can see that if we start from the transport sector, uh, we see that there is an increase in the CO2 emission in the transport sector uh, because the um, reduction uh, um, in the demand due to less commuting uh, means also that there is a, a lower consumption that hinders the stock renewal and there is a slower penetration of the clean technology. 
So uh, how the system react in order to offset this increase uh, in the emission in the transport sector, we see that there is a shift of bioenergy to buildings. And at the same time, so there is an increase in the burden for the energy conversion sector with, for example, the deployment of more CCS, CCS. In the end, we are still able to meet uh, a net zero target and the energy cost reduced by 9 million francs over the time horizon in the e world. So drawing some conclusion from this, um, we can say that digitalization can contribute to an affordable transition, but the targeted policies are needed to avoid rebound effect. So this means if, for example, we consider this as lower penetration rate of, of clean technology, we need to be sure that clean technology are uh, attractive when uh, we introduce different practices and different lifestyles. And so, yeah, this was the conclusion. And I thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer some questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I personally, uh, I found it extremely important to uh, take that into account because uh, it looks like we are moving more and more uh, into that digital world. Uh, so a uh, couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned from the beginning uh, something about level of digitalization in the country. So I'm just curious, well, how do you measure that? Or how, what, the, what, is, what is the proper approach like Currently in the US, what is the level of digitalization versus Switzerland? What is the level of digitalization? Is there, is there some index which helps us to understand that? Um, so thanks for the question. There are some index uh, about the digital um, level uh, of, of a country in general. And there are also some uh, digital reports when we can see the um, uh, we can compare different countries with some, uh, some fixed benchmark. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, uh, what we use for Switzerland is also when we discuss about the digital level of companies, uh, there are four indica indicators that you can use. And one is connected with the um, skills of the population in using ICT. One is connected, is mainly connected with the um, utilization of uh, e-commerce and online platform for, uh, for companies, etc. So there are four indica indicators that you can use. And according to uh, uh, if, uh, the, let's say, the, the companies or the firms decide to invest and increase the digital component uh, of, of this specific, in this specific category, then we see an increase also in the digital level. Uh, of, uh, of the selected company and the country. Yeah, thank you. So a reminder, please use uh, the chat option, uh, ask questions even uh, after uh, the presentation. Uh, and I see that Elmar has raised uh, his hand. So uh, Elmar, please go ahead and mute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, um, for this interesting presentation. I have a question on understanding your results. If you could go to your last slide. Uh, one more time, because there's something interesting there. I, I'm not fully understanding. Yeah, that's that's slide. Okay. Yes. Um, I would have expected that uh, um, the CO2 mission, and since there's more people staying at home, at least the energy demand would increase in the residential, and the energy demand in the transport sector would decrease. Yes. Um, compared to the uh, compared to the A word. Uh, but when you look at emissions, it's it's the other way around, right? We have an increase in emissions. You try to explain this with the car fleet, yes. and then there's a decrease or uh, lower emissions increase in residential. Can you, could you explain once why these counterintuitive effects taking place? Sure. So uh, thanks for the question. Uh, exactly as I said, uh, as you correctly say, there is an increase in the in the energy consumption for the, in the residential sector and a decrease in the transport sector. So here, uh, to explain why there is an increase in the CO2 emission of the transport sector, we have to go back and analyze how, uh, how uh, our decision process uh, works and how the equation works. And as I said, there was a behavioral component and an economic component. So what we have seen basically is that uh, reducing the, um, the, the fuel used for commuting. Also, this means that uh, all the other clean, uh, cleaner technologies were not more attractive 
uh, as they were if you still have to, to, to fuel your, uh, your cars and you have a CO2 taxes applied to your cars, etc. So basically we saw that the reducing the commuting uh, also slower the, this penetration rate of clean technologies. And this is basically why we have an increase of the CO2 emission in the transport, even though uh, there is a reduction in, in the demand. And uh, the interesting things between the transport and the residential sector in our model is also that they, the, um, the decision process between these two sectors are connected because an individual has to share this, a budget he has an income, an average income that he has to attribute to both uh, uh, his uh, transport activities or residential activities. So we also see that we were able to reallocate some costs from the transport to the residential. And this also allows to invest more in uh, uh, cleaner technology in the residential sector, like heat pumps, for example. So this is why in this case, we have a reduction in the residential sector. And the second thing is also that the models try to reach the target, shifting the biofuels uh, to, the, to the buildings in order to even more decarbonize uh, this sector and be sure that in the end we have a net zero um, scenario. So now uh, let's uh, move to uh, the next presentation, uh, Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Franz uh, from PIC. Uh, and uh, I think we are going to learn a little bit about aviation. So Sebastian, the floor is yours. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sebastian. I'm a research assistant at PIC and D uh, PhD student at DTU. And I'm focusing on hard to abate sectors uh, such as the aviation industry or maritime industry. And today I'm going to talk about the wide range of possible aviation demand futures after the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm presenting on behalf of my core first, Christoph, Betram and Mariana Orotoli. So jumping right into the topic, why is it interesting to look at aviation uh, demand, uh, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, the aviation industry is one of the most affected industries by the COVID uh, pandemic. And as we see uh, just recently with the uh, coming up of a new virus variant, we do see travel bans coming into place again, unfortunately. So uh it's very interesting and it's very um, dependent on people's behavior so uh, in order to look at aviation demand projections for different shared socioeconomic pathways we use the ht model which is uh, a standalone model but also coupled to pics remind model for a detailed representation of the transport sector and we modified it uh, a bit in order to represent uh, the social uh, aspects uh, we wanted to have in our model for the aviation industry. And it's now also uh, open sourcely available at the underlying GitHub repository. So our main research questions were, how does future aviation demand look like for different shared socioeconomic pathways? What are the long-term impacts of COVID-19 for the industry? And how uh, diff how do different uh, SSPs look when it comes to decarbonization challenge? Uh, jumping right into the methodology, we basically started with a definition of our scenarios we wanted to look at, and we finally ended up with three scenarios, the SSP1 scenario, SSP2, and then SSP5. Uh, all of them are different uh, have different challenges towards uh, climate mitigation, SSP1 very low challenges, while an SSP5 scenario carries uh, a lot of challenges towards climate mitigation. Uh, and after our definition of um, scenarios, we basically started with uh, uh, building up a disaggregated historical database with uh, a differentiation into international and into domestic aviation uh, demand, but also, and this was very hard, into uh, business related and leisure related trip purposes, which is very much essential when we are going to look at uh, COVID-19 impacts. Building upon this um, historical database, we used a very simple demand regression formulation using GDP per capita, population, fuel prices, uh, a price elasticity and an income elasticity. And I'm highlighting income elasticity uh, in this regard because in this study, we use the income elasticity as a specific tool to model uh, the saturation and demand. And of course, income elasticities are very uh, are not uniformly correct and they are very uh, 
subject in a way, subjective in a way, but um, they do offer the unique opportunity to model a saturation in demand on a country specific uh, level. So what we did in our uh, modeling approach here is we used a hybrid threshold uh, approach in order to uh, represent a country specific income elasticity. So we have uh, two thresholds, um, which you can see on the left hand side of the tables. First is a GDP uh, per capita threshold. So once a certain value of GDP per capita in the respective country is being reached, in this case, um, in our baseline case, we are using 40,000 US dollars per capita uh, decay process for the underlying income elasticity of the respective country starts, and then the income elasticity will uh, decay yearly by a certain amount of uh, percentage. In, for example, here in the SSP1 uh, scenario, the income elasticity will decrease by 5%, while in SSP5 scenario, it will decrease by 1%. And this is very much in line with the underlying narratives of SSP1 uh, carrying lower challenges towards climate mitigation and thus reaching a faster saturation in demand in this uh, very uh, carbon intensive industry. And, uh, Additionally to the GDP per capita threshold, we also implemented a revenue per passenger kilometer uh, threshold, which is basically the amount of uh, uh, kilometers as respective countries flying per capita. And here we also have a differentiation across SSPs, not only for the decay rate, for the yearly decay rate, but also for the uh, threshold. So for an SSP1, our decay process for the income elasticity starts with 2,000 revenue per passenger kilometers per capita, while in SSP5, we start with 6,000. And this leads us to a, a very detailed and diversified picture of um, income elasticities for respective countries. And um, in this case, on the right-hand side, you can see regional average income elasticity. So in SSP1, the decay is way faster, representing a very uh, strong uh, saturation in demand. And as uh, and thus uh, uh, posing lower uh, climate mitigation challenges. So building upon this uh, case, we basically had our historical database. We uh, created a reference uh, scenario with the uh, mentioned the income elasticity approach. Uh, building upon this, we used uh, exogenous COVID shock, which is basically highly uh, motivated by uh, or driven by uh, the assumption uh, of business-related trip purposes uh, going are going to decay because um, of the persistent usage of online communication platforms such as Zoom or Skype. Uh, and that's why we see a stronger uh, uh, decrease in business-related trip purposes compared to leisure-related trip purposes. And this leads us to our assumptions towards uh, long-term recovery and of course, all of these uh, projections are driven by our assumptions, and that's why we made them. Uh, we made the model very flexible in terms of uh, adjusting these parameters for uh, the future. If we have more information about how uh, how the COVID pandemic uh, affects our behavior, and for example, here on the right hand side, one can see the long term impacts uh, we assume. So, for example, in SSP one scenario, we assume uh, for the business-related trip purposes, we assume only a 50% recovery to uh, compared to pre-COVID uh, levels, while in SSP5 scenario, we assume that uh, the business-related trip purposes are only affected uh, to a small proportion, and in this case, uh, they will recover up uh, to 90% compared to pre-COVID um, values. And this leads us to our uh, results. So, Right here, I'm showing our SSP1, SSP2, and SSP5 uh, pre-COVID scenario. And I'm comparing these here uh, to uh, reference data from the aviation integrated model from uh, the UCL uh, group around Andreas Schäfer, who uh, have a very detailed bottom-up gravity type uh, model. And we can see that our projections are very much in line with theirs uh, specifically, our SSP5 is very much in line, but also our SSP1 and SSP2 uh, are in line when it comes to the growth and dynamics, but they are just modeled a little bit more conservatively. When we show the COVID impact, we see that 
and the aviation industry in 21st century could either expand to tenfold in an SSP5 uh, world, or it could just double in an SSP1 world. So we see there's a huge impact on socioeconomics and also the emphasis one puts on modeling these uh, strict uh, implementation of the SSP narratives into uh, or for the underlying uh, aviation demand projections. So we see SSP5 uh, COVID uh, scenarios, which is just called SSP5 because uh, obviously COVID happened. So it's a reality. So SSP5 um, uh, generates eightfold or ninefold the amount compared to an SSP1 case. When looking at aftermath calculations such as uh, total takeoff and landings for different regions, on the left hand side, one can see the European region uh, representing the developed uh, markets, while on the right hand side, we see a Sub Saharan African region representing the developing uh, aviation markets. We do see that in an SSP1 or and also an SSP2 uh, scenario, uh, the European or the developed uh, markets. Uh, won't reach the uh, pre-COVID values um, anymore. And this uh, shift or this the difference uh, across SSPs is being uh, amplified by a shift from uh, domestic to international travel as we see a stronger competition in uh, domestic related uh, travelers uh, due to other transport modes such as high-speed railway. Or, uh, for example, but still, uh, for example, in developing countries, we still see an increase in uh, uh, airport infrastructure uh, operations uh, or total takeoff landings uh, for developing uh, markets. And then the same picture holds when we look at fuel demand. So we uh, see uh, huge challenges towards climate mitigation in an SSP5 scenario, uh, while an SSP1 scenario uh, poses uh, less challenges, obviously, and also an SSP2 scenario still uh, carries a lot of uh, burden when it comes to climate mitigation. So what does all of this uh, show us? Well, it shows us that uh, there is a continuous aviation demand growth, and there's going to be a continuous aviation demand growth if we are going to end up in an SSP5 or an SSP2 world. So it's very much essential to push for lower demand values in order to maintain a good chance of decarbonizing this sector. And when it comes to decarbonizing, so what does it take? Well, it takes a crucial paradigm shift uh, regarding frequent flyers and also business travelers, uh, which we already in our modeling approach assumed because, of, because we assumed a strong uh, impact for the business related trip purposes. So we really need to make this uh, theoretical perspective somehow translate into actual behavior. Furthermore, we do see, or we do need to confess that we should stop uh, investing into airport infrastructure, especially in developed markets, in order to avoid stranded assets. And this is very clear when we look at European or developed market uh, projections when it comes to uh, total takeoff and landings. And another big issue, which is very important when it comes to decarbonizing the aviation industry, is the incentivization of uh, the usage of sustainable aviation fuels, because everyone talks about them, um, but they just don't come out of nowhere. So we really need to have ambitious market-based measures, for example, an ambitious mark, uh, carbon pricing or, or uh, fueling standards. And we also need to talk about uh, uh, the ramping of um, the sustainable aviation fuels in order to ensure uh, coordinated expectations across all stakeholders, which would incentivize them and makes them makes it way more easier for them uh, to invest in these kind of technologies. And also, uh, we should start a discussion on bios availability and the green electricity uh, needed um, for the derivation of synthetic fuels for the aviation uh, industry. So finally, wrapping up, uh, we do see huge differences across these different uh, uh, shared socioeconomic pathways. And having this in mind, we believe that 
the restart of the aviation industry and also in, of international travel in general after the COVID-19 pandemic uh, poses a unique challenge for stakeholders, but also for policymakers to actually uh, push for these lower demand values in order to have a good chance of decarbonizing this uh, part to abate sector of uh, aviation. Yeah, thank you for thank you, thank Sebastian. You so Very interesting. Yeah. So uh, I think this is the first time I've seen the projections that, well, if I understood correctly, your graph that uh, uh, aviation demand in Europe actually already peaked. So there are some some scenarios where actually we are going to have a lower demand. So in my recent trip from COP, I was flying through Frankfurt. So I think well, they need to stop building that another terminal on the other side of the. Uh, runaway. Uh, if if your demand projections are correct, you better show them. <laughs> they're correct. So, uh, Volker, uh, you have a question, so please unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot. Interesting presentation. I had a message question, Sebastian. Um, you, you're basically using uh, income elasticities that vary by time and region, which um, and, and then across SSPs, which basically means you have one degree of freedom per region and time step for the projection, um, which to me um, begs a little bit the question why you're not kind of projecting growth rates directly. And in some sense, um, income doesn't have much explanatory power with income elasticities being, uh, yeah, essentially for each time period and, and region um, an independent uh, quantity. So maybe I got something wrong. It was just something that struck me. Uh, well, I think in a way we are kind of deriving uh, these growth rates, um, but just having a more granular approach um, with the uh, representation of income and elasticities, which should serve as a proxy for a saturation in demand, not only induced by income, uh, but also like in, in general. So, yeah, I don't, yeah, I think that's uh, the answer. Well, just alternative alternative ways of kind of trying to find. So yeah, and I see. And uh, I think Volker uh, uh, has written his question also in the chat. So maybe uh, you can, uh, try to uh, address that in writing and you have a little bit more time uh, uh, in comparison what we have here.